Let's finish this. Tonight, it's Crystal Palace v Chelsea and Arsenal v Leicester in two must-see fixtures. And with Now TV, you can watch both games live for just 9 99 Hold on, they're checking with VAR. That's confirmed, it's 9 99 Game changer. So, grab a Now TV Sky Sports Day Pass. Search Now TV Sports. 18 plus content stream via internet, full terms apply. This season of the wonderful big interview is brought to you by Bet365, the world's favourite online betting company. Be sure to give them a follow on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Hello, baby. <laughs> it's been weeks since I've mentioned the big bopper, but there he is, like a long net goose. Paul Clement, I was very, very proud of. I'd watched his dad play for QPR. I'd seen his brother come through the ranks at Chelsea. And when he emerged to coach PSG to success under Carlo Ancelotti and then moved to Spain, he fascinated me. He'd read both Barca and the Spain book, which tried to draw on the involvement and access that Vincente Del Bosque and his squad gave me during the three tournaments that they won. That book is now in paperback at 9.99. It's got incidents like the Spain players allowing me in the dressing room at the end of the World Cup final, what I saw, what they told me during the tournament. Have a read. I think you'll enjoy it. But Paul, coming to Spain and succeeding... To me, as a journalist born in the UK, seeing a Brit coming abroad and not only winning but convincing and showing a skill, I was terrifically proud. And although there were many highs and lows during the Ancelotti Paul Clement era at Real Madrid, the key thing was that in 2013 14 they were presented at the beginning of their tenure with a really difficult problem the arrival of Gareth Bale late in the summer, injured because of the way in which Daniel Levy had conducted the negotiations and Gareth had either missed training or missed key matches and had strained himself and was coming into Real Madrid where Clement and Ancelotti had to rejig the squad a number of times, integrate Gareth Bale, and they did it absolutely brilliantly. Here, Paul talks in great detail about a typical training day at Real Madrid. If you want to do what we hope the big interview often does for you and take you inside football, this is the one to listen to. Paul will tell you about the meetings, the planning, the communication, the pressure he was under. And the bit I like most in this first part, because part two is coming out on Saturday on the day of the Champions League final, because he will take us through minute by minute of the days around and at Lisbon 2014 when Real Madrid win the decima. The bit about how to rejig, how to reboot Angel Di Maria draw on his brilliant talent, but ask him to fulfil a completely different role in the centre of that engine room for Real Madrid. That was thrilling to watch. The fact that we get it properly explained was a joy to listen to. This is Paul Clement, European champion. Stand up, salute, sit down, listen. Well, this is exciting because the big interview is back on again. And although my memory is not all it once was, I don't think we've sat down with a Champions League winning coach before. But we have now a man who, as a Brit, I'm very proud of, Paul Clement, uh, came abroad, succeeded twice in France and Spain, won the Champions League. It's a real pleasure to know you. We started OK because people can't see it, but how was your steak? Well, it was amazing. I don't think people would understand the size of it if we try to really <laughs> explain it to them. Delicate portion, you're, you're saying? Well, my, the, the part I had was delicate. <laughs> yeah, was Done like a kipper. <laughs> Listeners, in the first 20 seconds, I'm going to have to up my game a little bit. He means me. It was good, though, at least. Really good lunch. But big. We're here to talk about football. And before I start the part where I praise you a lot... One of the reasons we believe that the big interview has been successful is that there's an audience out there who are hugely keen on understanding a little bit more about how football ticks, how players or teams improve, how you adapt 
systems and what coaching is like. And what's very, very clear is you're an exceptional coach. Would you, for example, be able to, whether you're amalgamating your experience uh, at Chelsea, Paris Saint-Germain and Real Madrid, or even pick a typical Real Madrid day, could you talk us through the day of a coach of your level when you want to achieve something? When you're up, when you get in, what your goals are, and the how of what you do to try and achieve your objectives in that day? Well, sure. Typically, when I was working at uh, the various clubs with Carlo, we would have an 11 o'clock start in terms of training. So that would be the time that the players would have to be ready to start on the pitch. So if we, if we count back from that, I would normally arrive at the training ground between 8 and 8.30 we would have already formulated some kind of ideas about what we were doing that day. So it wasn't a matter of then meeting and then deciding what we were going to do in training. Myself and Carlo would have pretty much worked on a a weekly plan. The afternoon before we'd left, we would have just had some uh, brief discussions about what the plan would be for the next day. And really the morning of the training was just to confirm that those ideas are what we're going to deliver and getting the final numbers off the doctor see if we needed any players to come up from the second team or the under 18 team to make sure we had the numbers that we needed so I arrive at 8 30 get some breakfast at the training ground at Baldebabus it was always really nice the food there you know the chef would prepare us a nice omelette or we'd have fresh juice and coffee etc and then the morning staff meeting that would be attended by the medical department whether it would be the doctor and the physio along with Carlo, the two assistants, so myself and Zidane in the first year, in the second year, Zidane and uh, myself and Hiero, uh, along with the fitness coach and uh, sports scientist Jack Naylor, who travelled from Chelsea to Paris Saint-Germain and and Real Madrid as well. That would be the group that would formulate what we were going to do for the day. That meeting would last anything from 15 to 30 minutes, depending on other issues there were, whether there were logistics regarding travel, speak a little bit more in detail about a player that was injured and what his plan was to return to training, and then finalise what the actual training would be in detail, you know, minute by minute, who would lead what part of the session, the organisation of that across the playing pitches. After that meeting, it would be, I would just finalise the, the training plan, so I'd always do a written training plan that would be handed out amongst the staff, so everyone knew who was to be where at the certain points of the, of the plan. Players were organised, practices were organised, and then I would go out on the, on the pitch to set that up, normally 30 minutes before training. So when the players arrived on the field at 11 o'clock, everything was prepared, we all knew what we were doing, and then we would execute the, the training plan. After training, there would be a period where we'd go back into the office, sometimes just reflect about the training how did that go there might be some video to review we wouldn't video always training but occasionally we would particularly if we'd done tactical work and if there were things that we needed to look at ready there to then show the players we would prepare that and then the afternoon was looking at games that we played in it mm-hmm. might be breaking down video from a previous game ready mm-hmm. to show back to the players or analysing the opposition that we were due to be playing now, by the time that's all done, now you're looking at uh, the late part of the afternoon and uh, you know you roll on to the next day. What language would it have been done in uh, Paris or in Madrid when you've got a disparate group of different nationalities and different languages? Yeah, I mean, in both France and, and Spanish, the morning meeting would have been done in the, the language of the club or the country we were in. So in, in Paris it was done in French and in Spain it was done in, in Spanish. There may be parts of that meeting that would have gone into English so there was further understanding and clarity needed. For precision. For precision yeah. for myself or, or Jack or even it went into Italian or French. It really depended who was in the room and what needed to be sort of communicated in greater detail. But in general, French in Paris and Spanish here in Madrid. And when you're not, like you've discussed it and it's clear and there's a quite a potent group meeting there there's you and Carla Jack and Zizou and whoever else or Fernando during that meeting it, it, do you largely keep quiet unless you've got something very specific to say or is it more a shared experience where the conversation goes around I've never seen Carla has been very very hierarchical but to be able to communicate well in a short space of time and get what you want out of that team meeting there must have been either rules that developed or rules that were set 
about who said what and when you spoke or why you asked a question or describe that well Carlo was very much in in control and in charge and were lead, was leading the morning meetings and uh, you know there would be days where he would be more involved and would have more information to communicate or details to go through with us and there would be other days where it would be more around the group Carlo never liked meetings for the sake of meetings mm. they were short precise and effective that was both with staff and also with players as well there was always a very clear purpose for having a meeting otherwise we didn't have them from my own point of view these were the most challenging times mm. were the meetings where not only are you giving or trying to receive information but it's that conversation that goes very quickly from Speed. one person yeah. to the other and yeah. I did find that difficult particularly in the first year in both clubs in more and more time I was able to pick up greater understanding of what the content of the conversations were but then it was hard to then communicate my own thoughts on things so you know I had to be very selective about what I said and when I said it and in the end I tried to use it as a strength rather than a, a weakness because you know coaches love to talk right? they love to talk and it can become ineffective <clears throat> what I learned in Spain and, and also in France is that when I communicated something it needed it to be spot on it needed to be the point so what it did for me really is it cut a lot of waffle out you know I, was, I viewed that as a positive thing and actually when I went back to Derby and started communicating back in my first language hopefully I was a more effective communicator because I said what needed to be said and nothing more than that I'm quite sure that Martin to my left and many hundreds of thousands of listeners are thinking right now that you could give me classes on that but I am what I am. And therefore, when that's finished and you go out, and let's say it's your session, what would in the first year Zizou be doing or Fernando be doing when they're not participating? What's the role when you're observing, when you're not taking that session? Or you're maybe not taking the morning session whatsoever. You're not going to waste. There'll be a purpose. What is it? You know, absolutely that was the case. There would be days when myself and Zizou and Fernando were, were very much up front, leading things right in the firing line. And there'd be other days where we were, you know, really taking a step back and Carlo was, you know, delivering his tactical work, which would very often be a Wednesday if we were playing Saturday. Wednesday would really be honing in on his full pitch tactical work. Um, we didn't tend to do that any closer to the game because when you start working on those big spaces, there is a demand physically we didn't want them to be working in big, hard, long spaces for long durations. If we ever did tactical work really close to the game, it would be in short, sharp bursts. So the majority of the tactical work over longer periods were done on a Wednesday. And that would be a time when I or, or Zizou or Fernando would really be stepping back. And at that point, yeah, we're looking, we're observing, we're taking on board absolutely what the coach is saying because we have to reinforce those messages. We're ready to be able to speak to him about things that we saw either during or after the session, that we thought that went well, or that probably needs a little bit more work. And also to be able to you know, speak to the players from another part of the pitch, another angle, either as a group or individually. I think that's what I was fishing for, because we live in an era where it's quite clear that you know, neither I nor Martin nor the people who are listening, we, we don't see the tsunami of data that you guys get. But I think we're all quite clear. The proper use of data, whether it's visual or whether it's statistical or whether it's health monitoring, has definitely improved your ability to understand what you're seeing, to interpret, and then maybe to go and apply it. But when you're under a tsunami of data, it can be just as bad as too much talking, too much waffle. And therefore, presumably, one of the great things that you can do to complement the data is, is watch very closely or listen very closely or interact with a player and just take that one-to-one -one understanding and if you've got data coming in on him or the defence or whatever, put the human side and the statistical side together. Is that right? No, I totally agree. I mean, we're in, a, we're in a, an era now where the information, the amount of information that is flowing to us on a daily basis is incredible. It's in our everyday lives and it's in our professional lives as well. And in football, it's no different. You know, you have data, a massive amount of data points on physically what the players are doing during sessions because they're wearing heart rate monitors and GPS units. There's all the video information that you've got available both in, in training and in games. And you know, through the different technology companies, you've got the physical data from, from games as well. So it's a massive amount of information. 
for me, you have to be really careful that in this time that you are not relying on that and that doesn't become the most important stuff. The most important stuff is the game and the game is played on the field with two large goals and 22 <laughs> players. Yeah. And you should not get away from, if you want to improve your team, you do it with tried and tested methods of quality coaching and communication on the field. You can support that with video because the images are very powerful. Around the outside of that are the other statistical elements, but they are not the most important. We never um, fish for secrets on the big interview, but I am trying to reach for real explanations, real examples. What do elite players like and not like about the situations you've described there? Like, for example, as a starter, well, I was always taught when United players, Manchester United players were taught to us about the era um, when they won the treble, the first thing they would say about Steve McLaren was the sessions are fun, they're quick, you're always on your toes. The transition between sessions, you very, but we're never bored. And, and there's also, we can see there's a purpose, but also there's a bit of laughs. And, and what you were being told was it's tight, it's efficient, it's fun, there's never any laps, nobody gets time to get bored, get up to mischief. But that, I would imagine there's more than that, and there are things that I wouldn't imagine, we wouldn't be able to imagine that players are like, well, not this. Drawing from your experience, what do elite players like and not like about those training sessions? Yeah, I think I can explain this. Having a lot of experience now of coaching and training both young players and senior players, it's, it's quite simple to explain. Particularly at the top level, the top players love competition and they don't like long periods of tactical work done in big spaces. Okay. It's no more complicated than that. <laughs> As a coach, you have to understand, and they have to understand as well, the importance of teamwork and mm -hmm. understanding what the plan is and what their roles are. The coach has to deliver that kind of work, and the coach also has to understand you know, what motivates the player, you know, what gets those levels of testosterone up, what's going to really get them motivated to be able to deliver that. We always used to try and do you know, one for us, one for them type. <laughs> mentality, you know, that we'd get a balance of delivering the tactical work yeah. and giving them that environment where they're motivated and they're feeling like they're competing. The way you describe it, it's almost like parents with kids. Well, we want to sell them this and that, but we're going to have to sort of pull the wool over their eyes a little bit. One for us, one for them. Seems smart. And the competitive thing, I guess people would have taken that for granted, that training was competitive. If you make it too open university or too scientific, maybe what you're talking about is bragging rights between, because now what you see in social media a lot is pictures of the five-a-side winners at training at all clubs. And what I remember and what I've written about, the thing that I still take as one of my great memories of having been present at Spain's three tournament wins was the end of the training session almost every time when they were at a tournament. The end of training session competition and penalties between Pepe Reina and Ica Casillas. We'll take 20 each, there's 50 euros on it. If we're 20, 20, we'll go, and we'll go until there's a winner. And sometimes you could have 50 penalties. You could be out there for an hour after, it's at night, they're abroad. It's a tournament. The manager said, we're going in there. And they would fight to the death over 50 euros. Mm -hmm. And there'd be celebrations. And watching that was like, I was transfixed. Because they should have been like, well, we've trained. We always train. It's time to go for our meal now. We'll go and play cards or we'll go and do whatever we're going to. No, no, no. Me and you, one-on-one. -on -one. Mm. Presumably that's the type of element you're trying to draw out in the competitive parts of the sessions. Yeah, and I think that's what the best players have got. That's part of the DNA that runs through them, you know, as well as the, you know, the physical, mental, you know, tactical capabilities. They are winners. I'll give an example, at uh, Madrid, you know, we, we like to encourage competition out in training, but it went outside of training as well. And this is something that the players themselves used to do, is that before training they would and after sometimes as well we'd play football tennis in the gym we had a small gym with an astroturf floors quite tight they used the walls as well it was very competitive they played one and one or two against two Alvaro Albaloa was really the, the leader of this but him and along with a number of other players would play very competitively before and after training to the point where it became a bug for them you know it, they, they loved to do it so we had to calm it down and eventually remove the net they were doing it too much so we banned football tennis for a little while because they were playing too much football tennis but they uh, erected a badminton net and that became the new way of competing with each other it would be it would be badminton 
and you know that was the nature of the, the players we were, we were dealing with. What was the threat there? The overexertion, physically pulling a muscle, or or tempers running high occasionally? No, it was it was more about the the load. You know, us controlling the load. Yeah. We were very uh, methodical about the way that we planned. We didn't uh, cater for that as part of their training program. So if they're playing. You know, 45 minutes before training a football tennis and then they go and play another hour afterwards you know that's a significant load in addition to what they've done on the training field. See that fascinates me my example is, is not identical but first time I was ever on a real Madrid training pitch was near as damn it here where the old training ground was we're yeah. about what 200 metres away yeah, from right the old there. training ground where oh happy days we were allowed to walk in watch it learn bump into the players he's coming up on this interview series some players would tell you you were dressed as if you'd come out of a jumble sale Hello, Steve McManaman. <laughs> but what I was able to do in Capello's first season when they won the title against Bobby Robson's Barcelona, I was welcomed in, an interview was coming up, stand and watch training. By the end of training, he wasn't ready to do the interview, but um, I was allowed to stay on, and he said, right, session over, everybody in. And two or three players stayed out, and they were out there about three, four minutes, knocking the ball out. When he came back out of the training room, sort of shed that he'd gone into to get changed, and he went, Everybody in now. And I was like, well, that's. And it was only a couple of minutes, but you're talking about that. If you don't have a level. So, would you have allowed five, six, seven, eight, ten minutes if they wanted to do what Kant and I was famously doing under Fergie? And, you know, then it became a positive. You'd go out, do more. And the, and the legend is that the class of 92 went, oh, what's this? That's not training, that's practice. And therefore, it changed the culture. This is, the, this is not my interpretation. This is what they've all said. Mm -hmm. So there's always a happy medium in anything in football. But what was the limit of if players wanted to do an extra 15 minutes or 20 minutes or half an hour? Did you calibrate the limit? No, of course. You'd, absolutely, you'd encourage that. And I think there'd be a concern. And this was always rowing. And we had this over the years. Not, not very much. Is that when uh, you blow the whistle for officially the end of training and yeah. everyone walks straight in. Okay, now that's a different scenario. That's not right, is we it? We wouldn't want that. No. You're actually better in a situation where you've got players that are saying, come on, let's do a little, let's do some free kicks, let's work on our long passing, defender, let's do that for 10 minutes. And then you're saying, okay, good. And now. Because you as Brazilians in your team, if Brazilians are walking off the pitch at the end, something is seriously wrong. Because they, they will always want to arse about with the ball doing this, that, and the next thing, fooling around with each other, practicing tricks. That's just in their nature. Yeah, yeah, no. So if everybody's off the pitch, then you can detect that you wouldn't have had that much. No, we certainly encouraged, you know, ad additional practice and supported it in a structured manner, but at the same time, you know, made sure that we monitored exactly that they weren't doing too much, you know, and they were going to be tired going into games. Well, let's take an example, or two examples, two superb free kick takers. How much would Cristiano practice his free kicks and how much would that would there ever have been a limit if he wanted to do half it how much did Gareth practice his free kicks or do they is the modern player so in control of the ball that they don't need to practice their ball taking I oh, know they practiced almost without fail before a game the day before a game they would be 15 to 20 minutes of central free kicks Sergio Ramos would be in that group so yeah Bale Ronaldo and Ramos with a goalkeeper before every game, would practice 15 to 20 minutes. We didn't like the group getting any bigger than that because there'd be too much queuing, and it wasn't necessary for massive numbers to practice that skill because ultimately you're looking at two or three players are going to step up and have that opportunity to take it in a game anyway. But multiply that by you know, 60 games, and we were 60 games. You know, that's that's just that's a good amount of practice. Gifgaf gives me flexibility to change my deal, to reflect my changing work situations, with no penalties. Also, the way Gifgaf has helped members and our local communities who need help at this challenging time is great. Cheers, Gifgaf. With flexible plans, no contracts, and helping communities in need, Gifgaf gives back. Come join us at gifgaf.com. Gifgaf, the mobile network run by you. Terms apply. Underground farming? How did that ever see the light of day? Hello, it's Claudia Winkleman here. I'm partnering with Vodafone Business to look at challenger brands, talking to the people who have bravely pushed ahead with their very different ideas, like bite-sized ice cream balls. Mmm, you'd think that would get a cool reception. I'm sorry. 
It's far from being business as usual, so we're calling the series Business Unusual. Not to be missed, I promise you. So go on, subscribe now. The jump I'd like to make is, is where I, I haven't warned you as I warn most of my guests that when I start praising you, it's sincere. It might sound too much, but it's why we're here. So I remember in that Champions League winning season that, or at least my interpretation was that Gareth Bale arrives after a long drawn out negotiation and arrives having not trained absolutely his ultimate at Spurs because he didn't know if he's coming or going in the pre-season he comes he gets injured and there's also a challenge about how you reorientate the team vis-a-vis the strategy vis-a-vis Gareth's arrival which has happened late it would have been lovely had he ever been signed in May joined in early July time to work in training pitch you're denied all that and one of the things that I really liked or the way I'd express it is that having experimented in the first two, three months of the season, it looked to me with a couple of formations, maybe 4-2-3-1 or 4-4-2, certainly probing to find the right balance and Gareth starting pretty centrally in the front three in the classical when he first arrives. At or around December, January, again, it appeared to me that he went to 4-3-3 with Benzema in the middle, Ronaldo on the left, Bale on the right, and the thing that I loved and the thing I want to ask you about and I, I, I still think is a masterwork that's underappreciated is taking an old-fashioned winger who could have played in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s as a winger in Angel Di Maria and turning him into maybe the European midfielder of the season. Certainly, I would say Madrid's player of the second half of the season. What was the project like? To make a player like that fit in a midfield where he has to track and tackle and not just beat players and entertain... Can you explain the, the concept behind it, the need for it? Have I described it adequately? And how did you approach it? Yeah, I mean, I, I hope my memory serves me well here, going back to that first season. You know, Carlo's idea initially when he arrived was to play Ronaldo as a striker. Now, whether that be, you know, through the middle on his own, or whether that be in partnership with Benzema, that was his idea, that he wanted him to play closer to the goal, he wanted to have less responsibility defensively. So, you know, early in the games, both in pre-season and I believe going into the start of the season as well, Cristiano played quite an advanced position. And he actually came and spoke to the coach about that he didn't feel overly comfortable playing in that position. You know, his upbringing as a player and through his time at Sporting and then at Manchester United was to play off the left. Mm -hmm. And from that position, you know, drive with the ball, come inside, was able to go down the left, Mm -hmm. was able to arrive at the back post from crossing positions from the right-hand side. And Carlo made a decision, you know, right then that he wanted, you know, arguably the best player in the world mm-hmm. to play where he was comfortable, mm-hmm. you know, and he wasn't going to make him play where he thought he would be better. Mm-hmm. He wanted the player to play where he was comfortable. Now, as a result of that... Yeah, that's, that's what I like. ...is what Carlo did behind him. Because in Marcelo, particularly in Marcelo, Contrail to a certain degree and tactically the way Carlo liked to play he loved to push the full backs forward so what happened in midfield was was crucial to the way the balance was achieved Di Maria had been at the club for you know a number of years and had mostly played as a winger either on the right or on the left you know that was his position but Carlo saw the potential in playing him in a, a three man midfield on the left and it worked really well because you know, one thing Angel can do is he can run and he can <laughs> run and run and run. He was able to get forward at the right time. So on that left of the three, we always try to get two of the players would have that offensive momentum. And the, one. the three would predominantly be Xabi Alonso in the middle. In the middle. Modric on the right. Up into his right. And then Angel in this, this on the left. new position for him. Yeah. On the left. So if you were attacking down the left side and you had the three left-sided players being Marcelo, Di Maria and Ronaldo, you would achieve balance by one of those being deeper and two going forward. Now, more often than not, it would actually be Ronaldo for sure, one of the three, and then the other... More often uh, than not would be Marcelo. Uh, the other two. It could can be... before, because I'm not taking the mickey, he can really play. Oh, yeah. But he is not your traditional left-back. No, he's, a, he's an offensive full-back. Very offensive. Which means that the guy, you use the word equilibrium, the guy who's got to be always wary, eyes in the back of his head, thinking about his position, and then whether he's positionally well or not, tracking back and tackling, is the guy who was the out and out winger before. 
which was Di so Maria. Can you see why it gets me so oh, excited about ach- what you achieved? Yeah, yeah. So Di Maria or Marcelo would have to provide the balance while the other one of those two was getting forward. Now, uh, Di Maria was still able to get forward and you saw in the Champions League in the, Did quite well. in the final. In extra time, he was, you know, it was him in that forward position that hit the cross that was deflected to the back post that Bale put in. So that, that's what happened uh, with Di Maria. And the other evolution of the team, which a lot of um, journalists at the time watching the team f- found it difficult to explain, to actually see what was happening, what is the shape, the formation of Real Madrid. Is it 4-3-3? Is it 4-4-2? But uh, actually it was a combination of the two, certainly towards the end of the season when we played um, Bayern Munich in the Champions League semi-final when we played Barcelona in the Copa del Rey final that actually defensively the shape was 4-4-2 without the ball without the ball yeah without the ball so Ronaldo and Benzema would be the two front players the line of four midfielders would be Di Maria would come onto the left Alonso and Modric in the midfield and Gareth Bale who probably then had the most demanding role physically because he could find himself furthest forward and then had to get back in the line of four and then we had a back four. But when you gain possession of the ball, we'd ask Bale to then push forward. Ronaldo liked to drift out onto the left. Benzema was through the middle. Di Maria could come slightly inside. Modric would move out to the left, to the right, sorry, and Alonso was in the middle. So 4-3-3 with the ball and 4-4-2 without the ball. Now that's something I really learned as a coach that you know, systems can don't have to be rigid. No, you know? no. The English mentality, certainly when I was being educated and coming up, was always quite rigid. You know, it's four four two, it's four four two defending, it's four four two attacking, or it's four three three, four three three, both sides of the ball. And under Carlo I learned that you can have a, a structure for defending and you can have a structure for attacking. And it really depends on getting the best out of your players. And I learned a lot there under that particular time. And you're making me laugh a little bit because uh, as a Scot, I was given the, the glorious responsibility of being the England correspondent in the late 90s, middle 90s, late 90s, for a newspaper, and, and Glenn Hoddle was the manager. And I remember the first time he mentioned that phrase, when all you could hear after it, he mentioned it to the journalists, was the scratching of heads. He said, 442 without the ball, 442 without, and it just it, it took, everybody was like, well, what, what, what's that? Oh, it, it, you hadn't heard it before, and we had to sit down and play with it, think with it, and it, it seemed to also, if it was demanding a lot of journalists, it seemed to also demand a lot of players, because players have to be intelligent, they have to be flexible, they have to pay attention, they have to practice movements about, like, if this, then that, if he's there, I must be, you're not just being vigilant about your opponent or yourself, you're being vigilant about who's next to you, not just because he's your pal, you must anticipate by 30, 40, 50 seconds what might happen. It's a testing, I think it's a testing system, but it's beautiful to watch. What I think we're in danger of doing is just gently underplaying the coaching and management role of making Angel de Maria understand and sign up for that. Because it's not like football manager, it's not like Sabutio, and it's not like swapping football cards. You have to go to a guy and say to him, Angel, this is what we need from you. This is what we'd like you to do. Carlos, the manager, takes ultimate responsibility. He might be asking it, but probably you've got to, between you and Zizou, you have to enforce it. And, and refine it and calibrate it on a daily basis in training. Did he handle it well? Did he understand it quickly? Was it his football intelligence or was it his personality that came into him saying, all right, I'll, I'll work harder, I'll move position and sacrifice myself so Marcelo can overlap all the time and do what I like doing, which is what I think you can look at it as. I think it's two things, really. It's One, it's, it's the way that the coach communicated the idea to him, but also the player recognising that I may need to adapt here if I want to contribute and play on a regular basis. Because with Bale having been signed and Benzema being really the lead striker, Ronaldo playing the left, it was going to be difficult for him to... At a club where Florentino's in charge and he's paid that money for yeah. Gareth, well, Gareth's yeah, playing. You know, you, yeah, you make that kind of financial commitment on a player, you can't have him sitting on the bench. I mean, it doesn't make any sense business-wise. So, you know, I think Angel recognised that as well and it was a team effort to make it work and it did. What was the process? Because you pinpointed the idea that the communication in the team meeting was the most testing because it was quick and it was intricate and it had to be precise. And presumably there were times when you or Carlo Aziz, you, you maybe had to do some one-on-one work with 
Angel or listen to him when he was unhappy or moaning or saying, well done, you, you've nailed that, brilliant, keep it going. Well, is there a degree of just, not parental care, but just continuous involvement to say to him, well done, son, you, you, you're getting this right, you're, you're making the team function? Yeah, those kind of conversations were, were going on all the time. And I remember, particularly at the time when um, Gareth had arrived and Angel wasn't starting so many games, that, you know, and this is a big part of a role of being an assistant, that you try and keep the player motivated and understand that he has a big role to play, even though at this moment he's not in the side. Mm. And uh, I remember having a couple of conversations with Angel saying, look, the coach is pleased with your work. I know you're not playing at the moment, but just keep working hard, be professional. You're going to get your opportunity. Things can change very quickly because he, he was in the team and then was out of the team yeah. as a winger. And, you know, I had, how can I say, slightly better relationships with certain players and Zizou did with, with others. Zizou had a fantastic relationship with Benzema. Benzema. They're, they're speaking in the same language. There was a lot of respect between the two of them. So there's also something, again, not parental but pastoral. It's like, for example, if Kareem was carrying a kilo or two, he would say, "Here's the clinic in the Dolomites that I went to." to and also, I think that they had similar cultural backgrounds, and it was Absolutely. mixed North African, mixed French, and there was a, there was a lot of just man to man human understanding between the two of them. No, right? absolutely. And uh, as assistants and professionals, we understood that that you know that was the right communication path for Zuzu to take with Karim and it worked and Carlo wanted that from his assistants as well you know he, he needed that from me my relationship with Bale and a lot of the more English speaking players that I had I say better relationships with mm, mm. Uh, Tony Cruz Kadira Alonso Arbaloa you know they would be the players that I would have much more detailed communication with because of the English language so you've tempted me but we were going to come to this already my memory is that as you progressed in the season, and I hope I'm not inventing the memory, but I, I remember bumping into you in the mix zone after the Espanyol Cup tie and saying, because it was the first time I'd really seen Angel de Maria working very hard, assiduously, knowing his duties in a 4 3 3 you win at Espanyol, and it just feels like things are turning a little bit. And throughout the remainder of the season, the Real Madrid is really, really enjoyable to watch, both in terms of the product of the football, but you can see how the working pieces are meshing. And you just get that feeling of group momentum, attitude, form coming together. Everybody kind of believes. You can see it. And that's a glorious thing to watch. Glorious. I don't know if you remember it the same way, but the semi-final first leg at home against a pretty powerful Bayern Munich. A Bayern Munich that... I'm certain wouldn't have intimidated you, but were rivals that I think you chose to play, if not cautiously against. There was a certainly, we're not going to get sucked in, we're not going to get on them, we're not going to allow them to score here. I'm not saying the one goal that I think Kareem got was enough, but it was a relatively conservative approach to that first leg of the semi-final. Is that accurate enough? I don't remember that game as well as I do the, the well, away, we'll come to that one. The away game. Don't worry. But... Uh, yeah, there was a, we had a solid defensive approach to that game. We gave up large amounts of the ball and for long periods. Bayern had it, Tony Cruz was playing in midfield. They were trying to break us down and our threat was going to come on, on the counter. We got the goal and you know, it was a fine margin going into the, into the next game. And I don't think any of us could have foreseen what was going to happen in the in the second leg. But did you worry about the Burnaby at all? Because that, these are all legitimate, clever tactics, and not only that, but they proved to be the right tactics. But the Burnaby was not very forgiving about tactically giving up the ball, allowing the other teams to play to suck them in because it's Real Madrid. Europe is ours, the ball is ours, that trophy is ours. They don't tend to spend a lot of time thinking about the nuances. They want you on top of the other team and scoring seven if possible. Yeah, sure. And in the game, you know, we even thought that we'd have more of it than we did <laughs> but the way the game panned out it's not always easy to try and take it particularly the way that they were playing as well I mean they were a really dominant force in terms of ball possession at that time the various ways to build out from the back players that were comfortable to take it in all areas of the field and were arguably the favourites of the tournament at that and it's Pep at that point it's Pep back against Madrid again yeah. all the little swirling things about memories of 2011 and Pep the ultra Catalan against Real Madrid and, and you go to Bavaria he subsequently said that the players convinced him to change his tactics and he did and I can't speak in asterisks so he's 
said it's the biggest fuck up of my life. Had you expected them to play the way they did? What, what was your tactical, strategic preparation for that night in the Allianz Arena? Cool, that's a, that's a good question. It was absolutely to you know, play on the counter that you know, we had the one nil advantage. It's slim, it's a slim advantage. But the fact that we were able to prevent them scoring and you know that the away goal carries is heavy, did give us that confidence that we knew that because we stopped them, we've got the firepower to be able to score, whether that be from a set play or a counter. With the way the team were playing, the form of Ronaldo, I'm not sure he had a, a lot of goals in the Champions League at that point. He was about to break the record, all-time record, yeah. and lasted since 1963. Right, so yeah, he was in massive goal-scoring form. So everybody seemed to be in massive physical fitness because what I'm trying to mash together and what I'd welcome as well is you know as you're watching it from the bench apart from the euphoria we're in the final it must have unrolled unraveled differently than you expected because as a spectacle it was really all Bayern were all over the place all over the place really quickly as soon as it was 2-0 on aggregate they weren't right and yet Ramos Ronaldo particularly Bale were playing as if they thought they were 16 feet tall and could beat 20 men that when form, confidence, strategy, trusting your teammates comes together, it's powerful. And, you know, there was a stage at which it looked as if you could have, you know, they, they were not long off putting seven past Barcelona. And on that night, until there was a little bit of retrenchment, it looked as if Real Madrid were going to put seven on Bayern Munich. Yeah, I mean, again, it's another game where they've had, they've had more of the ball, but uh, we were just more efficient, more effective. To, uh, the two set plays early on put us in a great position. Had they been trained? Yeah, of course. You know, we practiced set plays. We made sure that we were very organised you know, going into it. At that level, the finest detail is so important. So you know, we were very thorough with the set play preparation. And when the second one goes in, you know, the, the second Ramos header, 3-0 with two away goals. You know, we're, in a, we're in a fantastic position now. The counter was a fabulous goal and then rounded off with Ronaldo's free kick underneath the wall, which we spoke about in the, uh-huh. in the pre-game talk. We had a video of Bayern's wall jumping and um, you know Cristiano's taken on board what we showed. And there's one thing taking it on board and there's another thing executing that because to hit a ball low, hard, underneath the wall is not an easy skill to do. But, uh, it ended up being a fabulous result we've talked very technically up to now but just as a lifelong man of football sitting on that bench in Bavaria against Bayern Munich probably Real Madrid's most age old European feud which is not Barcelona in European terms it's Bayern Munich and you're uh, you know before half time you're in the final what was that like well, I, know, I know you didn't take cigars out but no, absolutely you, you, not. it's all the same uh, it wasn't until you know, we obviously were in a great position and it was going to be very difficult to not go through at that point but at the same time we're professionals and we know that anything can happen so it wasn't really till the last 15-20 minutes that you can really start to enjoy it and from my own point of view it was also a lot of relief that Newell was going to a Champions League final because I'd come very close before agonisingly close heartbreakingly close when it was at Chelsea because Hiddink was the manager and we were seconds away from going to Rome and playing Manchester United in a final and Iniesta come up with a moment of, of magic and they end up you know, winning four trophies in Guardiola's first season as manager. But such a close margin from us being there and some clear penalty claims that oh, yeah. you know, arguably one of them is absolutely a stonewall penalty. I think there's no doubt. You've read my book where I, I talk differently about some of the perceptions of the referee, but that was right. Yeah. Stick on, right? So after I that, couldn't believe yeah. it on that night. I could not believe it on that. So after that happened, you're thinking as a coach, you, you're never going to get in that situation again. I mean, that was what I was thinking. And the next day I was thinking, um, that's probably the closest I'll ever get to getting to a Champions League final. So five years later to have got into that position was fantastic. Are, are you spiritual at all? I mean, religious, religious, but, you know, did you think about life and destiny and karma? I, I ask because I do. No, I don't really, but uh, no, maybe I should after that happened. Maybe I should. <laughs> that's, that's a better answer than yes, and here's what I thought. Sometimes when I'm enjoying an atmosphere and uh, maybe I've done my 
report well. I look around and the, in those last 15 minutes when you're in the final and it's gone better than you could. Did you, did you look at the crowd? Did you, were there Madrid fans? Did, did you have family there? Or was that a purely professional venture? It, could you soak up anything before the final was won or afterwards? At the, in the semi-final? In the semi-final that you win. I don't forget Stamford Bridge. Yeah, in Bavaria, yeah. No, the semi-final in Germany was... Uh, no, I didn't have any, anyone there, friends or family. But just a, a wonderful feeling in the dressing room after. I also felt sad a little bit for Alonso because he played really well in that game. But he picked up a... Spanish Tiger, the tack on yeah, Spanish Tiger. He picked up a booking, which was a harsh one. And then looking at him in the dressing room afterwards and you know how professional he was. and What, it didn't on the night appear as if it had hurt him, broken him, affected him? No, in him. the game I thought he was excellent. He just got on with his job. But, you know, afterwards... You could see he was happy, but at the same time, you know, he knew he wasn't going to play in the final, which was, which was probably the, the disappointing part of that night. So one of the most extraordinary modern Champions League ties, when Madrid go to Pep Guardiola's Bayern Munich and absolutely pump them. That has to be a product not only of what Pep called the biggest screw-up of his coaching life when he changed his tactics at the behest of his players, but think about that brains trust that Paul talks about. Carlo himself, Zidane, input from Yero, pouring over details every single day about how to improve the squad, improve the team, improve the tactics, how to play and how to beat Bayern Munich. Smashing interview from Paul in part two is coming up on Champions League final Saturday at the San Siro where Carlo graced the pitch so many times, won so much. It's going to be a fabulous game, fabulous occasion. And on Saturday, part two will take you through the minute-by-minute, day-by-day build-up to winning of and celebrating of. This interview was conducted at the fabulous Vaca Nuestra steak restaurant, not far from the Bernabeu, up near Cusco. Go there, they will treat you brilliantly. It's an absolutely lovely restaurant. The big interview is produced by Backpage and me, Graham Hunter. As always, Alex A.D., edits it, sculpts it, makes it better for your listening enjoyment. Keep up to date with everything we're doing without using the American Secret Services. We like to call it Little Brother at grahamhunter.tv. There's a box where you put your email address. If you sign up, we'll send your newsletter. We'll let you know which guests are coming up. We'll take your suggestions about which guests we should include on our hit list. We'll take your questions and... As long as I don't forget them, as I did with Reno Gattuso and Joe Jordan. And no, it wasn't that I was feared of either Reno or Joe. I just forgot. When I don't forget, we'll put some of your questions to our guests. So feedback to us. Give us some of your random nonsense. We like that, as you know. GH Podcast is where you find us on Twitter and Instagram. No, I don't know what Instagram means. But keep in touch. We do this for you. We need you. We love you. And I think it shows. A gigantic thank you to the world's favourite online betting company, Bet365, for sponsoring this season of The Big Interview. Giftcard gives me flexibility to change my deal to reflect my changing work situations with no penalties. Also, the way Giftcard has helped members and our local communities who need help at this challenging time is great. Cheers, Giftcard. With flexible plans, no contracts, and helping communities in need, GifGaff gives back. Come join us at gifgaff.com. GifGaff, the mobile network run by you. Terms apply.